Welcome everyone. Welcome to the second day of these techniques in After Effects with Expressions. Hi there, I'm Simon Walker. I'm Director of Training at Maxon and I'm delighted again to welcome back the wonderful Jason Hare. Hi Jason. Hello, how are you doing? Doing great, thank you. We had some fantastic comments on the sessions yesterday, so thanks Jason and you've got some great stuff to share with us today, so this is good. Um, if you weren't here yesterday, and by the way, here here's the PDF with the three sessions, or there's or the six sessions technically, because Jason does them twice every day, and this is where we are for the second day, the um, intelligent pie charts. But um, you can book on to the tomorrow session as well, if you haven't already, and also you can look at the recordings of all these sessions um, that we share on this YouTube channel, the Maxon Volume Program Training Channel, and that's where we share everything after it's um, set up and um, you should be able to see shortly in a few hours time um, the today's recording and here's yesterday's one about um, using a graph with or an introduction to what we were talking about i think some of those things jason will reference today so hi mads um hal avaro hi aniket thank you for joining us um in fact uh, those those people who have posted in the question sections please feel free to do that as we go forward because then you can ask questions about what jason's doing and also let us know um, especially if technically you can't see the screen for any reason, and we can help you with that. But also, and here's another thing that Jason has very kindly shared with us, his project file for both yesterday and today and tomorrow. So these, these are name straps from yesterday that we were looking at. And also for today, here's the, the pie stats that Jason is about to introduce. But um, in, interestingly, with the expressions in the keyframes and the setup and the effect settings that he's added to it. So this is really, really useful to be able to kind of have a look at and see how these expressions are applied in a production environment rather than just as an esoteric um, expression in an abstract format. So thank you again, Jason, for sharing these. This is fantastic. And I'll give the links to all those things, the recording and the PDF and this project file download. I'll add those into the chat window right now. And also you'll get them as part of the automated email follow-up. Great. So will we, is there, is there a link to the project files? Yes. Yes, there is. I'll add it now. Okay. So let me transfer over to you, Jason. You can tell us a bit more about what we're going to, what you're going to be covering today. So I cool. should transfer over to you and you'll get the screen in a second. Should be there now. I haven't got it quite yet. Oh, here it is. Great. So we're seeing your bullet points. Good stuff. Cool. Hopefully it's not too far behind. <laughs> we'll so, find out. Yeah. If there is a delay, I'll let you know. So for those who are joining us again, I'll try not to spend too much time going over things we went over yesterday. Um, but obviously, this is all designed to be a sort of similar look, like a basic package of stats with three different elements. Um, and today we're going to look at pie charts. Yesterday we looked at name supers. So we'll step into Premiere. The whole point of this project is they're graphic elements designed that you can send to Premiere as motion graphics templates. And an editor can simply update things. So you can see here we are in Premiere using the essential graphics panel, which for those who don't know, can be found in the window, Essential Graphics. It's also normally in the Graphics tab by default. <clears throat> and then the point of this project is a designer can build a graphic with any kind of element. Obviously, I've put this together for the purpose of this demonstration and to give you guys the project. But you can see we can do things like we can change the text to uh, all previous meetings. We could say, um, I don't know, all meetings in the last year. And you'll see that will instantly update in the sequence. Um, we can also do things like at the moment we've got Olympiakos, which has got red in its logo, so I've picked red to go against green. We can use the drop downs to pick a different team. So I can pick Andolo, and that's a blue thing, so we can pick the blue off the logo. You see, it takes a second update, but now we've got a blue and green split graphic. And then the one extra thing we've got is we can play with the draw color. Um, I prefer a neutral color for the draw that doesn't sort of clash with the two teams, so it stands out pretty obviously. 
but I've given control because if one of the teams were black and white, like Juventus in the Italian football competition is black and white, you'd end up going with some sort of level of grey. So it might clash with this. Uh, it might be a case to make the draws a completely different colour. Um, we also have the controls to change the numbers. So I can make, use the slider and sort of change the numbers, which you'll see once it updates. Uh, so wins are up to 27, which changes their percentage to 47. So you see all the maths works automatically. And I'll step through the animation, but the idea is well of this graphic actually builds itself. So you can see it's designed that it could key over an outgoing shot. Obviously, it can be a bit slow in Premiere because you're actually using the After Effects engine to render up the image to show you. So it has to actually do a render frame by frame. So the more complicated the image is, the slow it will be, but it's not too fast, too slow rather. So we'll go back into After Effects and have a look at how it's all put together. Um, so as I did yesterday for those who watched, I'll actually turn everything off so we can sort of build it up from scratch. I won't actually build everything, but just talk you through all the different elements. Um, so the first thing which I discussed yesterday is I always start with a control layer, which in this case is just a null object, but it can also be an adjustment layer. It doesn't really do anything to the comp, but I use it as a dumping ground for the effects. So I can put all of my effects controls in here that control different attributes of the comp and using expressions, I'll reference back to these attributes. <clears throat> the point of this is when it comes to making the motion graphic template, most of my controls are in one place, so it's easy to get at them. So you can see we've got pretty much all the controls you just saw in Premiere. So we've got the three sliders for the three values, the away team in color and the home team in color and the draw color. The only thing we're missing is the title text, which we'll have a look at later. So as we started yesterday, we'll start with the background layer. For the background, I've used the universe array gun. Obviously the background can be anything. It could be a, a live shot or it could be anything you want. Um, I quite like universe because it gives you a range of different templates or presets, as you can see here. And all I've done is picked one, I think it was one of these two, and then gone in and tweaked the shapes. The other thing you can see is you can save presets. So here's my preset, which is the one I've actually used, which makes it easy to recall it. And you can also recall it in other apps. So that will be available in universe in Premiere or even in Avid if you wanted to sort of stay consistent. So it's a nice sort of cheat to build an elaborate background without having to go and animate hundreds of items. It does it all for you. I've not worried about the color. So there's a load of different controls. I've left the color by itself as it is because I've changed the color on this separate layer. The only other variation here is I've actually split it in two with these masks, which if I turn off that one, you can see it. I've basically got a right and left hand side. And that's just to allow me a little bit of animation to have them slide in as, as so. So they're just a copy of the same thing and then a mask. The next layer, I've got an adjustment layer, which if I turn that back on, it creates the colors. Um, first thing I've done is I use tint just to get rid of the color because I could have made it black and white in the array gun plugin itself, but it's just faster to do that. And anything you can do that saves a bit of time helps. Plus I know all the color controls are in this background color. Um, for those watching yesterday, I used the gradient ramp yesterday and used both colors the same. The reason I used gradient ramp is to keep the background consistent through the whole project. This time we've actually got the two colors, the red for the left, blue for the right, which matches those team badges when they were on screen. Um, these are fed using, if I go to the expressions, you can see these are coming from the control layer. Anyone who are not is not familiar with expressions, this is basically an address basically saying this comp, so the information is coming from this composition. It's telling you the layer to look at, which is called control. It's looking at the effect home color, which if I click on that, you can see, so it's looking at that effect and then it's looking at the color value. And it's as simple as setting those up. If we expand that out, not home team, home color. It's as simple as grab, just maximize that. Pick whip up to that color. And you can see it automatically builds the expression for you so you don't have to do anything and it's done. So that way you'll see we're going to use color a lot through the different elements here. 
this is just a nice way again the control layer of it brings all the color control into one place so when i change the color it's going to ripple through everything and saves me having to do the steps over and over again so <clears throat> the next step is <clears throat> excuse me um building up the different elements now a lot of these elements those who watch the name super yesterday will see a similar so if we turn on the hub layer and move forward to where it actually appears so there we have the HUD layer. There's actually two of them. Yes, so we had one, but it's a similar concept. We have the universe HUD gives you a range of different elements, such as these different heads up display items. And you can see I've cheated and actually gone for one. That's one of the first presets because I just thought it worked well. When I came up with the design, I sort of have an idea of elements in my head and then you just sort of play around. So I use this one and I've turned off one side of the chevrons. So you can see we've got bright ones on the right and only one or two on the left and then the opposite on this side. So it's basically just applying the preset and then tweaking a few of the controls. Within the HUD tool itself, we have four different elements. Um, in this case, I've only actually used three of them. So we have the shape and then we have chevrons on one side and chevrons on the other side. If I expand out the expressions with EE, you can see the main thing <clears throat> is the three different colors and they're all taken from the control comp. So that way, when you when you change the color, so it's like this heavy before it ripples through everything. If I go to here and I change that to green, you'll notice everything on the left side changes to green. It's all taking its color from the same position. I'll just undo that to keep it red for now. So that's pretty much all there is to the HUD elements. And obviously there's one on each side for the two different teams. <clears throat> and that animates on with a simple scale move. You can just see it. It'll zoom up at the beginning. It's just like a little keyframe on it, scale keyframes. So nothing that special, just bringing up the elements. <clears throat> My process for building these, I actually work backwards, as I said, I sort of come up with a design, put up, put out all the elements where I want them, then I get the mechanics to work, so all the automated numbers, and then the next step is I go back and do all the animation, so I sort of build it up, but that's always the last thing I do, although quite often I'm thinking about elements and how they're going to build up, because that might help you choose a particular element. So the next thing is the team logos. In this case, I've only got three, which is from the EuroLeague basketball competition. Um, the trick I do with these is we use this control layer. So we have the home team and then the away team. I'm basically using a drop down, which is a relatively new tool, drop down menu, an expression controller. It's quite nice when you hit edit, you can add as many as you want with the plus and minus. The name field, you can type in whatever you want. It's more for identification purposes. After Effects doesn't use it in any way, but After Effects does use this number. So you can see if I want Anadolu, it'll be number two, Olympiakos will be number one. So the trick here is I can stack up as many logos as I want, and I apply a simple um, expression onto the opacity. And I tend to have a pattern where I always use a variable on expressions because it keeps the functional part simple. <clears throat> so I've used this as, I've said variable A is looking at the control layer again to work out what the away team is, which if I just open that, so you can see there it's the away team and it's taking the information from the menu. And then it's, so that will give me a number of one to three. So then I'm using a simple if else statement saying, if that variable equals one, make it the opacity a hundred, otherwise make it zero. So in this case, because we've got a limb where we are what this is the away side. So we've got Anadolu, which we can see is the second option. It's coming out with the number two. So you can see there that's not on. If we go to the top option, Olympiakos, you can see instantly it becomes a hundred percent because it now equals one. I'll put that back just to keep it. So you can see here then that what I do is once I've got my expression working, I then copy it onto all the others. And you can see here that's saying if the variable equals two, and then this one, if the variable equals three, and you could go on and have a hundred if you wanted to. There is a trick I normally do where I'll actually build those into a nested composition or a pre-comp and have the 20, and then that way I can just bring that pre-comp in and reference it each time. It adds a bit more complexity, but it saves me having to go and change all these expressions hundreds of times. So that takes care of the logos. Again, they've just got a simple animation. I think they just scale up a little bit after the 
after the HUD element, as you can see there, it's sort of scaling similarly, but a bit delayed just to give a bit more dynamic movement to it. <clears throat> so the next element is the boxes on the graphs. Three of them, one for each side. You can see they're opening up with a little scale move, just a horizontal scale, and they're all staggered. So you can see here they're staggered, so the left side, then the center, then the right. That's just a very simple shape. The only thing with it is the color is the same expression again, taking the control from the control section. So again, all the color you see blue and the red ripples through everything, and then the gray for the draw that we talked about before. So nothing too complicated there. We then have the text for each of these boxes, which says wins or draws. Now, the one thing that I have done here, which is a, a, I think quite a cool little feature, is I'm quite fussy about the details. So the left text saying wins is appropriate because there's 50. If we go to the control and change that to one, it, you, one wins isn't really correct English. So we make it one win. So I've actually done a trick here where I've written an expression that says, so basically looking, the first variable is pointing at this number, the left number, which of course the number is coming from the slider in control. So it's sort of a, a bit of a daisy chain effect. So the same thing, the source text from here is coming from a slider. And then I've rounded that number because I don't want accidental numbers. But if we go to that first, so the point is because the home wins is a one, if, if someone because you can expand it with a slider and you can actually physically do it with a slider and you end up with numbers like that, 19.66. I don't want to see 19.66 wins. So I've basically applied a, a round formula onto that. Um, there is another element here where within the number, so we'll come back to this text, just sort of change course a little bit. So to generate this number, we have the number from the slider, which you just saw here. But then we also have another slider, which is actually applied to this, which if I hit you so you can see the keyframes, this is an animation slider. It's a technique I use a lot where it basically animates from zero up to one. And it's, I always use the same thing. It's always zero to one. If we go back to the expressions, the reason being is that, so this first variable A is whatever number is entered here. So at the moment it's 19.66. The second number is a slider and then we're multiplying the two together. So at that first keyframe, the number's always gonna be zero. And at the second number, at the second keyframe rather, the number will be whatever this number is. And then we put all of that within a math round to make sure it's locked to 20. So you can see there as I skip, skip through, the number counts up from zero to 20. So it's just a little bit more dynamic and another little animation element that makes it more interesting. So then going back to the text, the text is, has a variable which says, look at whatever this number is. And then I've just given it an if else statement again. So you see, I use this all the time, which is basically giving it an option. So basically it's saying that if that the number is one, we'll make the word win. For all other options, we'll make it wins, which I thought that's relevant because even for zero, you'd say zero wins, even though zero is a non-integer, but then one will be win and then every other possible number will be wins. So it's a simple formula of just saying, as long as that number's one, it's win, otherwise it's wins. So basically we use the same process on all of these different number fields. <clears throat> so you can see the same thing, we always got the rounded number. And the round number there is just, as I said, because people can slide you, that to pick a number if that's what you wanted to do and you don't want funny numbers. I'll type in a few controlled numbers here just for the sake of the percentages when we get to it. So that's getting all the text elements right for there. So the next step is I've used a fairly recent addition to the Red Giant universe called Progresso. Um, Progresso is a plugin that allows all kinds of graphical type devices. And you can see here the graphs build themselves as bar graphs, pie graphs. Technically we've called this a pie, pie graph, which would be one of these. Um, this tool calls these arcs, which is kind of a, a cut up pie graph. So. so you can pick one of these as a starting point, which is exactly what I've done, and then tweak it to give you what you want, which if we come into it, so you can see, I've just played around with a few bits. Now, there is a trick here that, this is where I'm sort of using the trick, 
typical Progresso tool is a single graph. I wanted three graphs and they're all sort of interacting with each other. So you can see here, I've got three slices, the base, slice two and slice three. So if we look at the base, you can see it's the shape and the first part of the graph. Slice two is just the second part of the graph. And then slice three is obviously the third part. <clears throat> You'll also see I've got three sliders, which works the same as the animation I just showed you. It's my standard animation trick. If we hit U to see the keyframes, you can see here that they're staggered. So the first one animates out the second, which if we come back here, you can actually see the effect. So it starts up with a little zoom animation to bring that up. And then you can see as we step through, so this will go from zero to one, which through the expression, which you'll see in a minute, makes that animate out. And then the draw section will animate out after that, as you can see there. And then the away side will animate out. And it just makes it a bit more dynamic having all three open out one at a time. So the trick here is building it up bit by bit. So that's what these sliders are. So I'll just close those down. So the first element, the base, as we've done everywhere else, you can see the color here is picked with the same standard expression, picking from the color, same color as the background and all the other elements. Um, and then we sort of get into the maths of it. Now, the maths is quite simple. With the Progresso tool, basically it's 100% will complete the circle. So this is quite simple because we're typing in a number, it just has to work out a percentage A, a percentage to work out the progress. To get to the percentage, it's a little bit convoluted, but if you remember maths from school, so we've got three different elements as A, B, and C in this case. So I've called them A, B, and C, and I've basically just used this, the pick whip tool to go and select the numbers. So you can see here they're all from the control layer. So they're basically, if we click up here, it's basically pick whip to these three numbers, home wins, away wins, and draws. So then I do a, a, a number to extract a percentage number because obviously they're, in this case, they're 20, 20 and 10. So that's sort of half of the 100%, if you like. But this is a standard formula. So we're going to look at A, which is the home wins, divided by the addition of all three, which should actually always equal 100% if you've done the maths right. But obviously those numbers could, in this case, they equal 50. So this is 20 divided by 50 multiplied by 100, which gives us 40%. So that's where we derive our percentage number from. And then you can see E variable is the slider, which controls the animation. So then it's simply a case of multiplying D, which is the 40% by E, which is the slider. And you can see here, if we go back, you'll actually see at that animates out from zero up to 40 as the section builds itself. So that's quite a nice thing. There is one thing, a progresso graph actually starts horizontally here. So I've had to adjust it to start it at minus 90 degrees. Um, that's more important on the next step. So obviously that's the base. So it's quite simple. That's all there is to it really is calculating a percentage from the three numbers that are entered in, animating it by the, uh, multiplying it rather by the slider to create the animation. So now shut that down. So now slice two gets a bit more complicated. Slice two, which is the draws, which if I turn it back on, will help us see it. There we go. <clears throat> so again, it's using the color picked from the control layer. Same trick all the time. It's also using progress, which is exactly the same formula, but this time I'm using C because C is the draws number. So it's draws divided by the addition of all three times 100 to create a percentage. So now the only thing is, while that's going to give us 20%, there is a catch that we need to play with this arc angle because the trick is I wanted to start wherever that one ends because otherwise that'll all be over the top of each other and we're trying to build a full circle. So on the arc angle, we've done another expression which basically says, <clears throat> look at the amount of the progress, which is 40%, you'll remember from we did when we did the base. There's the minus 90, which is the factor to bring the start point around to here. So then we've got the minus, we start off with the minus 90, and then we add to that whatever the progress amount was for the first level, which in this case is 40, um, which is 40% of a full circle. But because this works in degrees, we then multiply that by 3.6 to get a degree value, which in this case, when it's fully open, takes us to 54%. 
uh, 54 degrees rather. But that's 54 degrees coming off off this point. So it's telling it a 54 degree start point, keeping in mind that zero is there. So it's taking it that minus 90 plus the 54, which is that point. <clears throat> so that guarantees that slice two will start off the back of slice one, so they'll connect together. And then because the animation slider was um, step by, like comes one after the other, the second one will sort of build out of the first one. And then slice three is exactly the same again. It's the same percentage color. And then we've had to do the angle, but this time we're taking into account both slices and all I've done there is added A slice and, and the C slice to work out where B slice should start, which again, if we come forward, you'll see it perfectly starts at that point there to create a full circle, which you know will be correct because the numbers are all being derived from a formula which creates accurate percentages. <clears throat> so that's the sort of progresso element. Now, I wanted to put numbers on these to highlight the percentage amount because even though these are quite simple, when you come up with completely random numbers, it's nice to see the value as a percentage. So what I've done with that is, if we have a look at which one's this, let's go with the left on the home number, look at the expression. All I've done here is we've got the, Remember when we're using the progresso, we're using the progress to, con to control the amount. And that basically gives us, so the first one was 40%. So we're taking that number into this expression. So this comp layer, progresso one, effect base, progress, and then the dot value tells it to take it as a numerical value. I've then put at the end of it, a plus percentage sign, which just literally adds a percentage sign onto the end. And then you can do plus and then anything in inverted bracket inverted commas will be added to it. So if I add YY, you can see another percentage YY. So that's a good trick for adding words to a mathematically derived number. And then the math round on it allows it to stay as a full percentage. Um, the reason for that is as this number is counting up, I, I, a trick I use all the time, which I'll do now for the purpose of showing you, is I just add various text things all over the place when I'm building things, which I delete later. And then to work out what numbers are doing, if we expand this back out, we want to see what this progress number is doing. If we hold down Alt and apply an expression to that, pick whip it to the progress number, we'll then get an actual text number of what's happening here. So this number, which goes from zero to 40, um, which I've picked the third slice foolishly, but anyway, it'll still work. You'll see here at that point, it's 33.66666, which we don't want. So that's why I put this math round because then it disregards the percentage, the, the decimal value math round will just keep it them whole integers, which is much tidier in this case. There is a way which I cover tomorrow where I expand on math round and give you the option to add different percentage, uh, different decimal values. So you can have no decimals or one or two. But as I say, this is a simple trick that I use just to monitor what's happening so I can see that the math round is working because it's 34.66 and there it's gone to 35. And it's quite a useful trick just to see what maths is coming out of things, especially when you're trying to build formulas and make them work correctly. So that's all that we have for these numbers to generate the actual number value. The next thing is how they're positioned because you want them. The one thing I was going to say is if we go back to Progresso and have a look here, you'll see all of the Progressos have a numerical counter built into them. And because Progresso is basically a single graph unit with a number that shows your percentage or a value to get to that point, that works well. You can assign the number to be in the middle or in any arbitrary position, but normally if you want it following, it'll follow the leading edge of the graph. So in this case, the 35% would actually sit here. I like, because there's three numbers to avoid confusion, I like the number to sit in the center of the chunk. So to get them to sit in the center of the chunk, I've built up a system of nulls. So if we look at, we'll just look at one, let's just look at the left one to make it clear. So I start off with a null in the center, which is just perfectly centered to the progresso unit. And then that's gonna be rotated to make, to work out where this position is, which we do with expressions. And then I put another null out in the center of the gap between here, which is, partly trial and error, or you can do it mathematically. And then it, I've parented the 
outer one to the inner one. So now there's no animation at all on the outer one. It just sort of follows wherever the inner one is. So as you can see, you'll just see them rotate around if we come back to where it's moving. So you can see this one is locked onto this one. So the center one, as it rotates, it just keeps the outer one moving with it. So it's a nice way to keep it in the center. So I haven't had to worry about anything on that other than parenting. To work out the location, if we expand the expressions with EE again. All I've done here is, again, we've taken the same percentage value from the progress. So we know this is 40%. I then come up with a little formula that basically divides it by a value of 200, which is because to compensate the 360 here, but it basically chooses half of the value, so it makes it 20. And then by doing a calculation using the 360 degrees multiplied by that number, it'll keep it in the center of that, wherever that, whatever size that is. So if we come up here and make that huge, you'll see it still sits in the center of that section. So it's a nice way to do the maths to calculate a position for you. Now, the one thing that you may have noticed is because these two are rotating, I've then got the text is then parented to the moving null, like the outer null. So the text is locked to that corner point on that null, which you can see as it moves there. So now, obviously, this null is rotating. So that would be a problem that if we look at the text, if I turn off this expression, you can see here that the text actually sits on a nice angle, which also looks quite cool, but I wanted everything to be upright. But you can see that's rotating, so it's attached properly to the null as you'd expect it to work. Because I wanted it to sit upright, I've come up with another expression, which basically looks at looks at the rotation of the center null, and I've just put a negative in front of it, so it does the opposite rotation on the text. So then whatever value we have here, which you can see is minus 45.6, this has become the inverse of it, so it's 45.6. So whatever rotation that will do, the text will automatically rotate to counter the rotation of the null. So it's almost like a double rotation. It's unrotating itself. So that's, and then the same is applied to all three text numbers. You don't actually need to have the nulls on. It's useful when you're working on them to see the shapes, but it's cleaner to have them off. So then we've got our three numbers built. The only other element there is, is two very simple text layers which are added onto the top. I've put those at the top deliberately so they're next to the control because the control has all the elements that I'm going to want to use in the motion graphic and those two have the other elements. The rest of it is sort of color coded just to help me work out what's what while I'm building it. Um, something I did say yesterday, I'm quite fussy on how everything's named. I like all my layers to be named. I think it's partly because I do a lot of work sharing work with other editors and other designers. I think it's always good to do a job where anyone can pick it up and have half a chance at working out what you've done. If everything's called unnamed layer or default layer or null, no one has any clue what anything is. So at least this gives people a hint as to what's happening. So once we're happy with all the animation, the next step is to build the essential graphic. Uh, it's always good to make sure just, I always double click the sequence, make sure you've got the sequence selected again. Um, normally, for those who haven't used this panel, you'd come to it like this. Uh, we, the master, we can select a composition. This will give you a list of every composition in the project, including pre-comp, so it can become quite long if you've got a big project. Choose the composition you're interested in. Um, I've already built this one, which we'll go through it in a second. The name is what the, the MoGert is going to be called, so I'll add 800 onto the end of that, just so I can separate it from the one that's been already built. And then it's a case of, because the composition's open, I can hit solo supported properties and it will give you every possible property that I can apply to a essential graphic. Obviously in this case, we're trying to avoid an editor doing too much work. So we only want to give them control of the important things. Um, another thing in 2020 is they've added this group, which is quite nice. It just gives you a folder, which you can see I've used up here and it just allows you to sort the information into categories. So the first thing we've got is the page info, which is the two names. And that's just a case of pull the source text up into here. It won't let me do it because it's already there. And then that just gives you the field here. So you can see I can update that live and instantly it interacts. Um, one thing I would also do on that layer, which I failed to do here, is select the layer and I'd force caps on. 
to make sure it's always caps. And then that way, if someone like me comes along and types lowercase, it doesn't matter. And then in this case, by using edit properties, I've allowed access to the font selection and size adjustment. Now that's probably something I wouldn't do because this allows an editor to go in and change fonts. And on a lot of projects I work on, like this is this, this is modeled on EuroLeague, for example, they've got a special font that they use. So we can turn off the font selection. And you'll see now they've got the text and the font size. Font size is still useful because if they had a really long title like that, you can see that's come off the screen. So that now gives them scope to shrink it down to make sure you can fit the whole title in like that. So you can see it's quite useful to give the size. So the same with the subtitle, we just dragged up the source text layer, which allows you to write in that one. Again, we wouldn't give them that, so we'll turn off the font selection, and then they've just got size again, so the same thing. Just tidy that up a bit. Another thing for those who haven't done essential graphics before, you've got a poster time, which is basically a snapshot of the composition wherever you are. It's worth knowing about that because if it happens to be on the first frame, you're going to be giving out a still that looks like that. So always make sure you're on a frame that looks sensible. It Normally I find it defaults to something quite useful, but that's how you can change the poster frame. Poster frame is what you see in the little window when you're in Premiere. So then we've done the two text layers in page info. Then basically we're just using everything from within this control layer that we talked about. So we've got the home team, home color, away team, away color and then the sliders for the home winds, away winds, and draws, and then the draw color. So you can see all of the elements I've needed in here are all at the top. It's very quick and simple to do. Um, a little hint that people who make and sell templates, you can buy loads of cool templates on Video Hive. The one thing that always frustrates me is you always end up with a set of instructions where they're telling you go into such and such layer to change various values. Rather than doing that, if I were making templates, I'd be using the essential graphics panel because then you've basically given control of all the sort of changeable elements here. Those who know what they're doing can come in and play with this. In fact, when I deliver a project like this, because this can be used by an After Effects person as well, I've taught assistant producers to come in and build graphics using the essential graphics panel. But as a safety, I tend to use the shy layer on everything. I'll quickly do that. And then we can just shy the layers and then they're all hidden. So they're all still there and working, but that way I, an inexperienced person can come into After Effects, use this to generate what they need to generate, and they're not going to bump layers and move them around. And it's just a safety feature. So then back to the essential graphics, when we're happy that everything's working as we want, you can always test things and play with the colors. You can see there we changed the whole green side. The red, red's gone to green. You can change the logos, test that everything works, and you can see it's all working as you'd expect. We then just simply hit export motion graphics template to create the MoGert file. It'll always ask you to save it, say yes. It does its little dance through all the layers. And then ask you where you'd like to save it. Um, there's also options for missing fonts and things, but I don't normally bother with those. So then we're just gonna save this to the desktop. Hit okay, it takes a moment to save. And that's it. So we've now created our motion graphics template. So now if we go back into Premiere, um, you've basically, within the essential graphics that we looked at before, you've got browse and edit. If we go to browse, press the plus button, we can add a new MoGurt. So here's our MoGurt that we want on my desktop. I've Unfortunately, if you had a number of them, you can't bring them in simultaneously. You have to do them one by one, which is very frustrating, but that's the way it is. And you can see instantly here it is with our thumbnail. Um, but that's only brought it into the central graphics library. It's not part of the project. So you have to drag it in. In fact, if we just have a look, because I've already got some on there. So there's the ones we've got. When I drag that in, you'll notice another one will pop in there. So it's just importing it into the project. And there it is, that's the one we just built. So it's brought it into the project. Now, a question that has come up a number of times is if you want to update this later, my trick is I build a template project with all of these already sat on the timeline. And then that way, as long as an editor copies and uses this template project to get started, they're always gonna have the most up-to-date version because then I only have to fix it in the one template project in Premiere. 
you can see that this graphic, if we alt drag it to create a copy, they're now two independent, even though they're using the same templates, they work like a proper template. If we select that and wait for the beach ball, make it green. So you can see we've made that one green, we won't worry about the logo, but you can see the other version of it is as it was once it updates. Obviously keep in mind, these are referencing the After Effects engine. So due to the layers and the maths, it takes a moment to update when you change things. But you can see we've got full interactive control of all the elements. I just thought about it. There you go, you can see all the numbers are updating and it interactively updates the percentages. You see it's still having a bit of a think about it, but now it's caught up. So we've got 33 and 24. Now, so that's all there is to making the MoGa. There's one interesting problem I'll show you about. This this is something that comes up all the time. You build something and think it's really good, and then something always comes and bites you. And this is a classic example. I've, I stumbled upon these numbers by mistake, but this quite often happens where you get weird things. If we make um, the home winds 43, uh, the away winds 25, We get the beach ball. Oh, it's the beach ball. The trick here is what I'm doing is because I've used the math round function, we have four draws. When it calculates the percentages, because it's rounding everything up to the correct number, you can see they're the numbers exactly as we've entered them, but you'll see now the percentages, because they've worked out one by one, is now actually 101%, which is a little bit amateur looking. This is a problem I built this as, as a demo file. So there's bits of it that aren't quite working. This is something I would fix. Um, a very simple fix is knowing how the percentages work. A trick is you can just type 3.8 because you know each number is going to be rounded. So even though we type 3.8 in there, that will still round that up to four, but you can see instantly it's changed the percentage to five. So it's dropped it down a little bit enough to make it work. While that's a quick work around it's not really a solution because you'd have to tell every person using it that actually there's a bug check your numbers i would probably rebuild the expression which would take a bit of experimenting you know these three should add up to 100 percent so i'd probably make one of them work them work it out mathematically at the moment all three are worked out as a separate percentage but it would be fair to say that this one is 100 percent minus whatever these two are but then you can still get slight problems um, i guess the problem with this type of project is you're trying to make it flexible for everyone who's going to use it. And the more flexibility you introduce, is the more chance of errors and little things that can pop up. So that's sort of everything there is for it. I might invite Simon back and we can open it up to questions if anyone has any questions on parts of that that you didn't understand or want to have a look at. That's really interesting techniques there, Jason. Um, especially, um, TJ was saying earlier on about your method of being able to count um, the number of wins and then to change the plural um, when it's on one and then change it back to plural when it's on zero and so on. So that's it's really, really useful stuff. Um, James has got a question. Uh, did you hit any other snags when you were designing this particular item? And do you have any feedback from the editors that you needed to change after the fact? And I think that relates to the, the workflow, let's say that you're set up in a, um, in a studio or, or on an event, and then you need to run, um, run updates. Just wondered if what the usual protocol would be or how you might manage that. Um, well, yeah, there, there's always snags. I think like a good example is when I first did this project for the 2018 World Cup in Russia, I built it all and I didn't allow for any decimal places at all. And I sent it to the the people who employed me to do the job and they approved it all. But then when the job actually started, the producer who was assigned the job of creating the daily items, he was fascinated by percentages that were incredibly close rather than massively different numbers. So these sort of things didn't interest him. He liked them when it was sort of 42 and 43. So then the difference between 48 and 47, it would actually probably be like 47.6 and 47.3. And that's what he wanted. So he said to me, can you add decimals, which turned out to be a complete nightmare. So now I always build decimals into things when I'm doing an actual job. Um, the workflow for doing that sort of thing, 
there's a couple of things. Obviously, I've always got the master file with me. I did another job for the Rugby World Cup and they were asking for tweaks while they were in Japan working on the World Cup and I was back home in London fixing things. Um, the simple process I do is once you do update it, because by saving a new MoGert, it doesn't update automatically in the library. You have to physically delete what you have in the library and bring in a new one, but that still doesn't update these. I tend to bring it in, so you can see here I had a Pi stat, that was the original one, which I've got in my timeline here. Um, I haven't actually played with this myself, but I believe we can just alt drag the new version on, which that's not letting me do it like that, so that doesn't work. But what I would do in this situation is, as I said, I always make a template project. So I'd tidy those up, get rid of that one, because we know that's the old version, bring in the new one as we did, which you see is 1800 put that on the timeline and then I would save this and actually get rid of the other versions just to make sure there's no confusion keep it all tidy and then I would save this as a template project make sure you tell all the editors through whatever communication system you're using that to make sure they use the latest version and then when an editor picks this up to do a job they should copy this at root level so make a copy of this project and then use this to edit from and then that way you're guaranteeing everyone's always using the latest version of anything Al's feeling your pain because he, he asked a question just as you were explaining this about the essential graphics um, support saving over an existing template, the same workflow you're talking about. And he always finds that finding a bug and changing it and having to then work out which one to delete is a bit of a pain. So yes, I, exactly. I think that's true. Yeah. I, I think there's a number of things like I found when I first started playing with it, I found it weird that the library is almost like a redundant position. Like one thing I do now is when you do import something into the library, it creates an AE graphic file, which I can show you the ones for this project. Uh, they automatically put it to so wherever you're, so here's my Premiere project and it creates a folder called motion graphic template. And you'll see these randomly named folders. These are the ones we've brought in today. So in fact, there's the one for the earlier session. So there's the one hidden within randomly generated folders. I tend to pull them all out into a tidy folder and you can actually relink. So for example, if I move that one out of that folder so it's tidier, that's all well and good and it makes it easier to find instead of these random folders. But you'll notice back in our project, it's gone offline. But the nice thing is you can simply relink to them. And this is another idea is you could, this could be a quick way to do it is actually blow away. So in fact, this could be the quick answer to that, is if you got rid of your original one, so delete this one, so you've only got the new one, come into your project, which will then be offline automatically. Um, where is it? Link media. And then locate our new one, which is in here. So where is it? Pi 18. In a second, that will, and now it's back online. So that's another way you can do it and then save the project. And then that way it's always going to reference that new AE graphic file. That's a nice workaround actually. That's pretty cool. That, so I guess, that's pretty good. I know in Premiere started to be able, if you moved around folders whilst it was open, it started to be able to identify those. So I wonder if that would, uh, or rather um, it used to on footage. So that'd be an interesting thing if you could do that with these as well. Yeah, it, it certainly doesn't at the moment. I still find that does do it with, with rushes because that always, sometimes I like to hide a, hide rushes in a folder to make it go offline, but Premiere just finds it again annoyingly. <laughs> exactly. That's tricky when you're trying to switch around different proxies as well. Uh, one thing that um, question that did come up earlier was the idea about dealing with easing in and easing out and then modifying an animation and then how you might evolve an animation over time whether you did that with keyframes or in expressions and i think you've got a fantastic trick for that yeah okay. so this is something that i was talking about before with progresso so if we look at these three elements of the the pie graph again um, as you saw, I use all the expressions to generate the numerical values, and then I use sliders to create the animation. So you can see if we look at the first chunk, which is animating here, so it goes from zero on this keyframe to one on this keyframe, which is a multiplier at the moment, that's doing it in a linear fashion, so that will be nice and smooth. 
In this case, I prefer linear because I'm doing three separate animations and they're daisy chained one after the other. It'll create a smooth sort of movement. But if you did want that to ease in and out, because I'm using sliders to control the animation, you can actually simply just add your ease in and out onto those keyframes. And then because mathematically it's using these sliders to generate the values, that will now have an ease in, so it'll ease in, out, in, out. I would think that would be a bit ugly for this process because it would sort of stag, it would sort of slow down and then start up again and slow down and start up. But this is part of my process of build the graphic and then get, work backwards to animate it because another great example here is all this animation, if I now decide, or, or I show this to the producer and they say, I love it, but it takes forever for that to come out, I can simply grab all my keyframes, hold down the first keyframe, hold down Alt, and drag the last keyframe, you can see it collapses the animation. So now we have exactly the same animation, but it all happens much quicker. Or likewise, we could make it much slower if you want. But the nice thing is without having to go and mess with the expressions, I can simply mess around with the timing at any point. Obviously, I'm only doing the progresso part. You'd want to do that with everything, but you could always grab everything and get all the keyframes up and collapse and move them. That's a good point because then, although you can do um, slowing down and speeding up and pendulum changes and that sort of thing, expressions, you're right. You have to then jump in, and then you're you're basic. You're entering text there, rather than just stretching out time and letting it automate how it's then talking to the graphics. So I think it's yeah. a really nice time saver. And I think you've got to be wary of all your layers like these ones here. I would normally tidy up. You can see that that's just an opacity keyframe. So you could argue that. That, that's probably actually a bit messier than I would normally like. If I had more time, I would tidy up things like make sure that layer starts where it starts because there's no point having it. Or in fact, you could even get rid of the opacity and just have it start on the keyframe you want it to appear. So I, I guess it's the thing. There's not really any right and wrong. And at the end of the day, it's about the result you see on screen. I try and keep things as tidy as possible. Just so if someone has to pick it up, you can work out what it is I'm trying to do. Absolutely, especially when you're working in a team environment. Uh, Rob had a great comment earlier on about not only naming is useful when you're sharing files, but it's also useful when you're opening up your old file that you haven't worked on for ages. Uh, I've done well, that so many times opening it up and it's like solid one, solid two, solid three. It takes me 10 minutes to work out what on earth I was doing before. Well, exactly. And I think part of like I do a lot of these stats projects for big sports events and each one gets a little bit better than the last one. Like when I did the first World Cup, I didn't have Progresso and it was quite a different style. Um, then I did the Rugby World Cup and I sort of pushed things and came up with these ideas and then had to work out, I sort of sold the production on ideas and then I had to work out how to actually make it happen. I was working on the Euros, which has been cancelled and moved till next year, but it's a project sort of still in the making. And now that I have my hands on Progresso and we'll be using Universe um, tools there, I can use things like these elements just to create better looking stuff. And it's just an idea of sometimes plugins help do things. Any, anything I've done here, you could do with or without plugins, but to create quick backgrounds, this is where plugins really come ahead and like quick, quick, cool looking graphs. Um, you can add the plugins to it. So quite often I will start, like when I start the Euro project, I actually started by deconstructing my own project from last year for the Rugby World Cup. And each project is always a build on the last project, sort of making things better as you go and coming up with new ideas. Yeah, it's worth, it's worth pointing out that um, a lot of the, or in fact, all of the expressions techniques that Jason's been pointing out, you can, of course, apply to any layer and any uh, feature inside After Effects. But it's the that nature of being able to like test out designs and use something which has all if it's a preset and it's automated before you can ch check out whether or not that's going to be working for you without having to then build it yourself and then discount it and then and continue moving on because i think you mentioned earlier about it's the speed of doing things which is the key especially in sport yeah i, I think a project of this sort of nature you need a production who's willing to spend money in advance because these work by spending a couple of weeks before the event starts but then the idea is that like when i do one for the euros we'll have one or maybe two editors or at the last world cup for example one editor was charged with making a preview for a stats based preview for every match which meant in that one month period he had to make 64 of them some days delivering four by himself so having graphics here he can 
having graphics that you can build by simply entering a few numbers and picking a, a badge actually made it possible because without that he would have to have a graphic designer dedicated to him who's building the graphics and that makes it cost a lot more so it's kind of although it probably took me about 10 to 15 days to build it and get it all working accurately that's much cheaper than hiring a graphic designer for 35 days and not that we want to do people out of work but everyone's got a budget and they're trying to make things look as good as they can for as little money as possible and these techniques help with that absolutely yes absolutely the what i thought i'd do is just to give um a, a particular a reminder about where to get some of these resources todd's asked if the project file will be available for two days webinar too yeah absolutely todd we've we've got this i put it in the notes earlier on the chat window but let me just see here we go i'll add that again in answer to your question and one and thing about the, the project it, file actually covers everything so it's it's one project file with these five compositions in it which includes tomorrow's composition absolutely yes so that the same project file link works for yesterday's today's and tomorrow's yes yeah <laughs> thanks, exactly. for, thanks again for sharing that no problem Great. Okay, I'm going to grab the screen from you if that's all right. Of course. Jason. And show my screen too. Here we go. For what it's worth, by the way, I've just been putting in some of these other links, um, like the links to some of the things that um, Jason's been looking at, which are available as tutorials like Getting Started with HUD and Progresso and um, a Ray Gun and some of the other universe tools. So that's why those links are be popping up in the chat window. But um, if you wanted to watch the recording, then you can watch this. In case you missed this at the beginning, you can watch all the recordings of these on the Maxon Volume Program Training YouTube channel. And you'll get the link to this and the project file and also links for tomorrow's session. If you haven't booked on already, here we go under this PDF, which shows you what we're covering tomorrow or what Jason's covering. So automated bar graphs. And also, if you've got any follow-up questions or you want to schedule one of these sessions for your team, please let us know, training at maxon.net, because all these sessions um, are what we're making public. This is just an example of the sorts of things that we do as part of the team licenses, which are complementary. So if you'd like, Jason, to run a similar session like this into your team and help set up a workflow, we can set that up. So please let us know. Um, and also, by the way, on these recordings, um, a question from Anikit about um, C4D MoGraph in After Effects. We absolute, absolutely cover these in some of the sessions. We've got in this library a number of um, how you might use um, Cinema and After Effects together. So have a look at these, especially the ones that are say connecting um, C4D and Universe and Trap Code and some of the other ones about 3D4D MoGraph um, that Lionel put together as well as Nick Harris. So th this is what we're trying to do, we're trying to give you a library of these different examples. But thanks, thanks for the reminder of that. We'll we'll schedule some more of that. Um, and also thank you for the nice the nice comments <laughs> that are coming in um, about um, how informative it was. It is fascinating and really interesting to, to have an insight to your world, Jason, and to see how you not only decide what's put together, but also your problem solving techniques. I think that's really interesting too. Yeah. I hope it helps people. It's immensely, immensely. We had lots of nice comments. Thanks, Matthew, Peter, Todd, Brian, Joanne. That's um, really nice to know that um, it's useful and it's working. So this is great. Fantastic, great. Okay, so we'll um, again finish on time. <laughs> this is a rare occasion for us. Usually we go over by a couple of minutes, but we're on time today. So we'll see you on tomorrow's session. Please um, feel free to join us. And we'll, we'll talk about um, the automated bar graphs that we mentioned. Um, but until then, stay safe and we'll catch you on the next one. All right, thanks everyone. Bye-bye.